All right, guys. All right, welcome to this lecture. Um, yeah, so we talked about the principle of creation and what went wrong, right? What was God's original ideal? And then uh, what happened to see the world that we see today? And I wanted to give this lecture titled Messiah and I, because we all need saving in some sense. You know? We understand our potential. We have unlimited potential to be you know, perfect in our nature, have divine nature as God did. So we all need a Messiah, and I would like us to relate it to our personal lives as well, because ultimately the goal is to live a fulfilling life. So when I think about me here, and when I imagine an unfulfilling life, I imagine a life of, you know, a life of broken relationships, a life of you know, insecurity, and anxiety, and low self-esteem, no confidence in myself. But when I think about a, a life of fulfillment, I think of something completely different. So I want you guys to help me out here. And when you imagine a, a life, a fulfilling life for you, what do you guys think of? What are some words that come to your head? Purpose. Purpose. Great. Achievements. Achievements. Healthy relationships. Healthy relationships. Awesome. And you guys said purpose and accomplishment, kind of like having a life that's dedicated to a higher purpose or a larger vision is an exciting one. Now your purpose. And also, I also think that uh, being encouraged to discover like your own unique personality and how best you can give love is also an exciting uh, thing about a fulfilling life. So discovering our own unique personalities. Like for me, I receive love best, I think, when someone, you know, for example, they, they ask me how I'm doing and ask me what I'm doing in life. And then like, say a couple months later when I see them again, they're like, oh, like, how's this going? You know? And they really show that they care and they really remember um, what, what I was going through. So everyone has their own unique way of receiving love, ultimately to experience fulfillment. So as we said, sin goes to, or allows us, or because of sin, we live a life of unfulfillment. And sin can also be thought of, thought of as fallen nature. And a, a life of fulfillment can be achieved through virtue by ultimately realizing our original nature centered on God. So how can we live this life of fulfillment? Where does this come from? Well, throughout history, God has been raising up his people to ultimately, for the hope that we can live this fulfilling life. And he does so by sending the Messiah. So the Messiah in Hebrew is defined as the anointed one or the king. And God throughout history, since the time of Abraham, Abraham is, is known as the father of faith. And he's known as the father of faith because God made a covenant with him in Genesis. In Genesis 17, God promises to Abraham, I'll make, I'll make you exceedingly fruitful and I'll make nations out of you. Kings shall come from you. And I will give to you and to your offspring the land where you are now alien. He was in Canaan at this point, and he didn't, they didn't own this land. All the land of Canaan for a perpetual home, and I will be their God. So since the time of Abraham, God has been raising his people, the chosen people of Israel, or the descendants of Abraham. So this Messiah's purpose was to guide fallen people to the kingdom of heaven, on, first on earth and in heaven. This is what complete salvation is, right? This uh, life of perfection where every, everyone has perfect character, therefore we can live in the kingdom of heaven. So this Messiah was none other than Jesus Christ 2000 years ago. Once again, how do we know that Jesus Christ's mission was for complete salvation? Well, in the Gospels, you read that Jesus spoke to his disciples and asked them to pray a certain way. And this prayer is actually a prayer that all Catholic school kids learn. 
I'm sure many you you learned this prayer. I I still know this prayer from the top of my head, and it's the Our Father because Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That kingdom come, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those and for, uh, forgive their trespasses. Or as we forgive those, what was it, many? <laughs> We forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation. <clears throat> deliver us from sin. Amen. Deliver us, from, deliver us from sin. So this is the ultimate goal. But what does the kingdom of heaven look like on earth? We have to visualize it. It's not, it shouldn't just be a, a concept that we just keep repeating and repeating. It's a living reality that, that can happen. So what does the kingdom of heaven look like? Well, people are in oneness with God. So they experience God in their daily lives as a living reality. You know, like during our mundane lives, when we, you know, wake up every day and sometimes we don't feel inspired, it's difficult to feel connected to God. But in the kingdom of heaven, we experience God's heart and God's love daily as a living reality. The second quality of the kingdom of heaven is that we do not have original sin. No original sin. As Luke mentioned in the fall, the original sin was the root cause of all the suffering we see here today in this world. So the Messiah should be able to cleanse us from original sin and allow us to experience, you know, not original sin, but divine nature and in the lineage of God. Lastly, children are born good because of As we said, because, or, because of the original sin, every descendant after Adam and Eve had sin and were claimed by Satan. So children in the kingdom of heaven should also be born good and sinless without sin. And also, uh, in the kingdom of heaven, there should be no need for a ardent like life of faith, like a life of fervent prayer and, and seeking for God. The reason why is because we will experience, once again, God in our daily life. So I don't want to say no life of faith, but a different kind of life of faith where we experience God every day. So Jesus was supposed to accomplish this. And unfortunately, as we know throughout Christian tradition, he was unable to. He was sent to the cross, crucified and murdered by his own people. But the question is, the question that I want to revisit is if Jesus, Jesus' death on the cross accomplished complete salvation. That's the question I want to answer today. So let's look at the world today. Do we see people in oneness with God? Absolutely not. Do, do we see people of no original sin? No, people are still, you know, have, people still have this contradiction of good and evil. And it's a battle every day we wake up between a good decision and a bad decision. And we still need an ardent life of faith. Children are still born with original sin. So, so we don't see here that Jesus, Jesus' death on the cross accomplished complete salvation. Did it? So does that mean that the cross, that Jesus' death on the cross was for no reason? If, if your intuition says no, then you're right. Because it was not for no reason. It was for an important reason. And we can see this through uh, Christian history. So Jesus was, you know, one man and 12 disciples in Jerusalem. And over the matter of hundred, only like 100 years, it spread all across Rome. Emperor Constantine had a dream about Jesus and made it the, the official religion of Rome. Many, many martyrs, many saints and sages have given their lives to Jesus because they felt so connected to Jesus, Jesus and what he gave to them through his death. We also see in our own personal experiences that knowing that Jesus died for our sins gives us tremendous grace. You know? When I think about the Jesus sacrifice, for me, he was thinking about the future descendants. He was thinking about me. He was thinking about you. That gives me so much hope and so much love from Jesus. So we do see that the cross 
did have an important uh, factor in God's providence. Okay. So the questions that I now want to answer, right, is why wasn't Jesus able to accomplish uh, the mission of complete salvation? Because we don't see it today. And to what extent was the, uh, the crucifixion? To what is the limit of salvation by the redemption of Christ? To what extent was the salvation? So to understand uh, why Jesus wasn't able to accomplish his mission, we have to go into his life. What happened in Jesus' life? So going back, Jesus, before Jesus' birth, God prepared, prepared the chosen people to receive him. <laughs> Even before his birth, the angel Gabriel appeared to his mother Mary. And she, he said that, uh, let, uh, let me actually pull up the, the verse, make it easier. Um, the verse said, Gabriel said unto Mary, and now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be, will be called the son of the most high, and the Lord will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. They're expecting him to be a king, to bring everlasting peace, as Isaiah 9, as the prophet Isaiah mentioned. In addition, the three wise men uh, received the revelation from God, and they followed the North Star all the way to the manger just to meet the chosen one who was born. And as, they were, as the three wise men were navigating into Rome, trying to find this manger, they, they were talking to, they're asking these Romans, like, oh, where is Jesus? Where is the one to come? We received this revelation. And the emperor, the king of uh, Jerusalem at that time, or Israel at that time, King Herod, heard about this. And because he heard about this, he actually ordered them to kill all newborns, male newborns in Jerusalem. He says, or the, the wise men say, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we have observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened. And all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he incurred of them where the Messiah was to be born. And he told them to kill all newborns so that they killed the kill Messiah. So we can see here that there are evil forces at play. Despite Jesus or God preparing Jesus' coming, there's also a lot of oppositions. In addition to Jesus' birth, there's another figure in uh, Jesus' life that plays an important part in his journey. And his name is John the Baptist, JTB. John the Baptist also had a miraculous birth. Actually, before he was born, uh, his father, Zechariah, was a high priest. An angel came to him and said, your wife, who's very old now, will give birth to a son. And Zechariah just kind of started laughing. He's like, what are you talking about? She's like 100 years old. Like, there's no way, like, he, she's going to uh, give birth to a son. Because of that, you know, he, he, was, uh, he was made mute for a long time until he, uh, John the Baptist was born. He named him John. And Zechariah's prophecy, or the angel um, approaching Zechariah, said to him, and your child will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give knowledge of salvation for his people by the forgiveness of their sins. So the, so the angel is saying, John will be the one who's going to prepare the way of the Lord. Because in order for people to accept the Messiah, to receive the Messiah, God needs to, or people need to be able to prepare the way for Jesus. It's kind of like, you know, if Jesus were to walk on shards of glass in order to accomplish his mission, it would be very hard for him, and he could, could fall on the way. But if people like John the Baptist and those the, the prophets that God called to prepare the way can clean the floor into a, a nice red carpet, Jesus can stroll along and bring, bring salvation to the people. And that was God's plan. In addition to, in addition to that, after John the Baptist and Jesus reached adulthood, Jesus started his mission around the age of 30. And in his ministry, it was, very, it was a very controversial ministry. And he was going around saying, 
I am the way. If you want to see God, you, you have to go through me. I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. These are huge claims. He is saying that the God who the chosen people of Israel have been having faith in for hundreds of years is in him. That's a huge claim. He says here, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From, from now on, you do know him and have seen him. So these claims started to rile up Israel at this time. Now, they're waiting for a Messiah. They, they all know about John the Baptist's miracle birth. You know, Zechariah was a high prophet, like I said. They were in a very well-off place. So everyone heard about this, uh, this birth, this prophecy. So people are thinking, okay, John the Baptist is here to prepare the way for the Lord. So the Lord must come around now. We have to find this, uh, the one who has come to save us. But when Jesus is saying almost blasphemous claims as, as this, as he is like God, people don't understand that. Why? Because of his original image. He, he's born of a carpenter. He's, he's a very low class, economically low class individual. And people, there's, there's also actually theories going around, like murmurs and rumors around his, uh, Jerusalem that, that are saying that Jesus might actually be a bastard child. Like jo Joseph not, might, might not be his father. And being a bastard child at that time was considered dirty, unholy. And you could be you know, completely exiled for that. So his image wasn't like correlating with what he was saying. So people were really confused because the prophet, uh, the prophet Isaiah before them uh, prophecy that he will be the king, bring everlasting peace. And you see someone who's, you know, around homeless people and, and prostitutes and called a bastard son. How, how is he supposed to be the one to come? It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And this is what started uh, the Jewish people, especially the Pharisees and the Sadducees, to disbelieve in him. And because they disbelieved in him, this led to Jesus' death. But like I said, Jesus' death was not the desired will of God. Because the desired will of God is complete salvation. The kingdom of heaven on earth, where we can all be in oneness with God. And we can see that Jesus also knew that this was not his, the primary will of God. He even laments in Matthew 23. <laughs> he says... He says, he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophet in stone and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you are not willing. So he said, I'm trying and I'm trying to get you guys to believe. I'm trying to save you all. I am the one who you've been waiting for. But still you do not believe. Every prophet that has come your way, you have killed. Now, Isaiah was cut in half for prophesying about the Messiah. Now, many prophets died because, and Jesus was weeping. We also see that throughout his ministry, he tries to convince the people. You know, if he was supposed to die, there was no reason to, to attempt so, uh, so, to put so much effort to convince uh, the people of Israel that he is the Messiah. He even did, did miracles. And you can see here in uh, the passages, he says, this is the work of God, that you believe in him and whom he sent. What, so uh, yeah, sorry. This is the work of God, that you believe in him, whom he has sent. And they still didn't believe in him. They still called him a blasphemer. So he even said, if you do not believe me, at least believe the works. At least believe the miracles that I have, have uh, given to your people. But they still did not believe. And at this time, times are, this time is getting really challenging for Jesus. Jesus is starting to, to realize that he might be crucified. The rumors going around Jerusalem that he should be killed. You know, he is saying that he's God, but he is not. So 
At this time, he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane at night, and he brings three of his disciples with him, his three closest disciples. And he sits there, and, and at this time, he's very scared. He tells his disciples, you know, I'm very distressed. I'm deeply grieved, even, even to the death. Remain here and stay awake with me. I'm going to die. Please just stay awake and pray with me. So he leaves his disciples and goes to pray. And he says, my father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Let this cup pass from me. This cup is, of course, death. No, I don't want to die. No, I, I have come, I've dedicated my life for you. And this is not Jesus showing weakness. This is not Jesus showing that he's scared of death. You know, he's not, he's not saying, you know, I, I, I'm trying to inherit my dad's carpentry business, and I'm not trying to die right now. He's, he's not thinking about himself here. He's thinking about the world and his, his divine mission to save these people. So when he says, pass this cup of death, he's saying, pass this cup so that the people can experience the, the complete self, can be saved. They can be completely saved. And he comes back to the disciples, and he sees them sleeping. And he says, you know, your spirit is strong, but your flesh is weak. Please, you know, stay up and pray for me. He goes back, prays again. He comes back the second time, they're asleep again. So the third time, he comes back to pray. He says, pass this cup for me, yet not what I want, but what you want. Not what I want, but what you want. This is, this resonates with me a lot because when he says that, even at the point of death, even at the face of death, he's willing to fully commit to God. He's willing, he's willing to fully give his life for God. And that is the highest form of love. That, that is God's love. This is why Jesus is known, is, is compared to God. Because he realized the purpose of creation. He, he is in complete oneness with God. So that means he also possesses the love of God. Unfortunately, he was betrayed by Judas and forced to carry the cross all the way up Golgotha. And he was nailed to the cross. He was spat at. He was insulted. The Romans said, you know, if... If you could come, if you're the Messiah, come down from the cross right now. And they're mocking him. And despite that, on the cross, on the verge of death, he says, Forgive them, Father, for they do not know what they are doing. So he's at the point of death right now. He's 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 dying. And he sees his whole family looking at him, watching him, weeping for him. And somehow he's able to have the love, not to think of himself, but to think of the people who are murdering him. And he's saying, forgive them, God. You know, please don't hurt them. This is how much he loved the people at this time. And soon after, he says, God, why have you forsaken me? Why did you leave me? You know, and He's saying here that, you know, God, like, I, I'm, I want to do your will. Like, is there any, shouldn't there have been any other way to complete this, to save these people? So he's confused at this point. Like, he doesn't feel God at this point because, you know, God had to tearfully, you know, leave him at this point because God can't intervene with human, human free will. So when the people cho choose to massacre Jesus, God, tearfully has to respect free will. So at this point, Jesus was confused. He was, he was maybe even angry. But his last words were, his, his last breath and his last words were that, or he said, I lift my soul up to you, God. I lift my soul up to you. He's like, I don't understand, like, I, I want this to happen. And you know, I don't understand why you, like, you, you can't do anything, but I completely surrender to you. 
even if I don't understand at this point, I know you have a, a better, bigger plan for me. This was Jesus' uh, heart here. And because he was able to fully surrender himself and fully you know, commit himself to God at this point, this is why Christians say that death was defeated. Death usually is accompanied by fear. Like you're, you're scared to die. And you want to cling on to physical life. But Jesus defeated death in the sense that he wasn't afraid to die for himself. So the question now is, why did the people disbelieve? Other than his image. You know, like, like I said, there were many prophets that came before him and, and even angels that predicted Jesus' birth as a chosen one. Why did they believe? Or why did they disbelieve? Well, we have to look into the character of John the Baptist. John the Baptist had a divine mission to prepare the way of the Lord, like I said. But unfortunately, he, he didn't recognize that. In Malachi chapter 4, verse 6, in Malachi chapter 4, verse 6, the prophet Malachi prophesied that Elijah must come before the Lord. Elijah must come before the Lord. So when Jesus is talking about how he's the one to come, despite his image, you know, he's preaching revolutionary thought. He's saying, love your enemy. You know, he's performing miracles. Things that people have, have not seen, have never seen. But when the Pharisees and the scribes, they go back to their, their Torah, which they had faith in. You look at Malachi chapter 4, verse 6, and they say, okay, like, even if we, even if Jesus may be Messiah, Elijah has to come first. Elijah has to come first. And they, they'll, they'll stay true to that word. So now they're asking, okay, who can Elijah be? Who could Elijah be? Well, John the Baptist had, was supposed to be this real Elijah, the returning Elijah. Elijah was a prophet that came to prepare the or to extinguish some Satan's influences in the world. He fought like 400 plus like evil prophets that worshiped like evil gods. And he was unable to fulfill, Elijah was unable to fulfill his mission of completely wiping away Satan's influences to prepare the way for the Lord. So Elijah must come back. But in, in the Torah, it says Elijah died, left on a flaming chariot. He didn't just die. He hopped on a chariot with horses and he just flew up. So now the people are expecting Elijah to come down the same way he came up. So they're looking up in the sky, but they don't see Elijah. But they go back to John the Baptist's miracle birth, saying he is the one to prepare the way for the Lord. In addition to that, John the Baptist also had a revelation by baptizing Jesus. When in the early times of Jesus' ministry, actually, John the Baptist Jesus goes to the Jordan River where John the Baptist is baptizing the people. And uh, Jesus says, if Jesus wants to be baptized by John the Baptist. And John the Baptist says, you know, I'm not worthy to baptize you. Shouldn't you baptize me? And Jesus says, no, no I, I want you to baptize me to all righteousness. So I'm trying to look, uh, get the, um, the verse. <laughs> I can't find it. But anyway, uh, John the Baptist, when, when he baptizes Jesus, he sees a Holy Spirit descend upon Jesus. And he hears a voice saying, this is my son who I'm most pleased. So God tells John the Baptist directly that Jesus is the Messiah. And throughout the miracles of your life, you are the returning Elijah. You are to prepare the way for the Lord. And mind you, John the Baptist was a rock star at this time. He had thousands of followers. The Pharisees, Sadducees, common people, all of them followed him because he lived a holy life. He would often fast in the desert, eating only honey and locusts. You know, he would baptize people and constantly say, I'm preparing the way for the Lord. The Lord is coming. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
John the Baptist had so many followers. So he had, he had the ability to turn the image of Jesus or bring the people to Jesus. So they, they, they may receive the Messiah. But then after this period of inspiration, he goes back home. The next day, he's actually still inspired. He sees Jesus walking again. He says, and with his two disciples, he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes the sins of the world. And the two disciples from John actually follow Jesus because John was testifying to Jesus the day, the day after this revelation. But only two. Yeah, thousands, like I said, only two. Why? Why only two? Because soon after, John the Baptist started doubting. Started thinking, Jesus? That's the Messiah? He's my cousin. You know, I played with him growing up. You know? Mary would often go to Elizabeth's house. John the Baptist's mother. It's, it's fair to conclude that they, they knew each other since, since they were kids. Look at, look at who he's hanging out with. Homeless people, prostitutes. He's saying that he's, he's like God. Now, going back to the verse. Going back to the verse. Yes. Uh, he, starts, he starts denying. And ultimately, the people of Jerusalem, the people of Israel, they come to John the Baptist because they're thinking about Jesus potentially being the Messiah. And they say, John, are you the Messiah? Because you are the, you are more, you seem more holy. You have a better reputation. Are you the Messiah? Though? He says, no, I'm not. And the, the Pharisees then ask, okay, then, are you Elijah then? And by asking this question, they're indirectly asking, is Jesus the Messiah? Because if Elijah says he is a if John the Baptist says he is Elijah, as he is, then that would be a channel for the people to receive Jesus. Because John the Baptist says Jesus is the Messiah, or he's the Elijah, and that means Jesus' account checks, checks through. You know, it makes sense. But he says, no, not Elijah. And he say, and who are you then? Are you at least a prophet? The prophet? He's like, no. And the, the first they get frustrated. They're like, it, time is now. Something is happening. But you're just denying everything. We don't understand. We're confused. He says, who are you then? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And what does John the Baptist say? say? He says, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. So you, see, you see how he's not completely denying that He's a prophet, but he's not completely accepting that he's Elijah, or he's a returning Elijah to prepare the way for Jesus. So at this point, in his, in his mind when he says this, he's thinking like, okay, Jesus might be the Messiah. Like, I had that inspiration a, a while ago, but I, I don't know. Like, look at his image. Look at who he is. So what I'm going to do is I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say I'm Elijah because I, I, don't, I don't have... I don't have full faith that I'm not ready to commit to say that Jesus is the Messiah. I'm not ready to commit all my followers to Jesus. That's a very humbling action. All your followers you give to Jesus. And he, he starts, he, but he has a sense that Jesus may be the Messiah, so he kind of half asses it. He, he, he half commits. You know, and this is the this this was the problem. And because of this half commitment. Due to a lack of faith. Because of this, he ended up leaving Jesus. He separated from Jesus. Even one account in John actually depicts how John was baptizing at one side of the Jordan River. And Jesus was baptizing on the other side of the Jordan River. And how sad is that? Like, John was supposed to be with Jesus. They were supposed to be united. But John didn't consider it that way. He even said to one of his disciples, who asked him, like, why are you two like baptizing differently? Who has the authority? And he says something like, like, you should be baptized by him. He's he's a holy one. But he never commits to say that he's the Messiah because he's still doubting. He's he's ignorant. He's he doesn't have full faith. So instead, he says, and in the the main points of his response that showed that he disunited with Jesus is when he said. As he increases, I decrease. That's what he said after. What does that mean? It means that 
he thinks if he gives Jesus all his uh, all followers and completely testifies to them with complete faith, he thinks of course Jesus will raise, rise up, but John will decrease and he will have no followers and no reputation. But that's not true. If he did unite with Jesus, he would, he would rise up just as Jesus would rise up. He would rise up even higher than where he was at that point. Because he would have fulfilled his mission as the returning of the land. He would have fulfilled his mission to prepare the way for the Lord. So this is why Jesus died. Because of the disbelief of the people due to the faithlessness and ignorance of John the Baptist. Now John the Baptist is seen as a great prophet in Christian history. But now understanding Jesus' death was not the primarily, primary a will of God. You understand that John the Baptist was a crucial cornerstone for Jesus' success. And that cornerstone crumbled when the rubber met the road. And this applies to our lives today. You know? How many times do we have an inspiration and we say, okay, I'm going to do this every single day. I'm going to be this type of person. And then when the rubber meets the road, we wake up one day and we're not inspired. It's like, ah. Oh, like, I don't really feel like doing this. Like, I, I've said that many times, like, when I wanted to read the Bible, for example. I'm going to read the entire gospel in the summer. And then, you know, a couple of weeks later, I wake up and I'm like, ah, oh, like, I don't know if I really want to do this. Inspiration fades. This is why, you know, some people say, you know, if we all had God's revelation you know, all the time, then, like, everything would be all right. But that's not true because... Revelation, inspiration fades. We have to be able to fully commit even when these inspirations fade. Now, the last piece of evidence I wanted to share of why Jesus' death uh, was not the desired will of God uh, is analyzing two verses in, in Isaiah. Isaiah was a prophet who, who a prophecy of the Messiah. This is Isaiah 9 and Isaiah 53. I'll go to the house. So in Isaiah 9, Isaiah prophecies that the Messiah will come uh, as a child born for them, a son given to them, and authority rests upon his children. And he's named Wonderful Counselor. He's named Mighty God. He's named the Everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward forevermore. Now, that's a hopeful prophecy. That is predicting that Jesus was going to fulfill the, the, uh, the providence of restoration, of restoring us to our original nature, being completely one with him. But we didn't see that, right? We didn't see that. And the other prophecy, Isaiah 53, same prophet prophesies, he was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, and as one from whom others hide their face. He was despised, and we held him of no account. He says, he was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent. By, perver by a perversion of justice, he was taken away was killed unjustly, for he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. So we see two contradicting prophecies from the same prophet. So what does this mean? You know, uh, modern Christian theology, we focus on this prophecy, that he, he, he came to die. If we look at just this prophecy, it makes sense that uh, God sent him to die. But if you understand the grand scheme of complete salvation, we understand Isaiah 9, that he's come, he's here to uh, be the everlasting father, to bring prince, prince of peace. Now, why are there contradicting testimonies here? The reason why is because God gave us a portion of human responsibility. In the principle of creation in the fall, we learned that God gave us free will. In order for us to you know, be perfect and experience life with him, he wouldn't want us to just be robots and for us to obey whatever he does. 
So the human portion of responsibility will determine how history progresses. So God, so when God revealed this prophecy to uh, Isaiah, he was basically saying, this prophecy will happen, everlasting king, prince of peace. He will reign on the throne forever and ever if humans fulfill their portion of responsibility in believing in Jesus and believing in the Messiah. Isaiah 53 prophecies would be fulfilled if the people disbelieve, rejected due to their ignorance and, and faithlessness and sent him to the cross. So this is why there are con contrasting prophecies here. You know, we'll see this many times in the Bible. Lastly, we talk about you know, Jesus not, uh, not being able to fulfill you know, the, uh, God's desire for complete salvation because of the faithlessness of his people. But we want to answer the question of, to what extent, what was the limit of his salvation? Because we know it was something. You know, because we do see the history of Christianity and in our own personal experiences through redemption. Well, the cross, uh, as we as we studied in the, in the fall, we both we have a spiritual self and a physical self. And during the fall, there was a spiritual fall and physical fall. The spiritual fall was the fall or this illicit central relationship between Lucifer and Eve. And the physical fall was the central relationship between Adam and Eve. The spiritual fall was worse because it was with an unintended spouse. So there must be uh, salvation for both the spirit self and the physical self. They're both tied to Satan. So we need to unshackle our chains and be completely with God. So the cross, through the belief in, Je through belief in Jesus, Jesus' sacrifice granted us spiritual salvation. This is why many people throughout Christian history have experienced so much grace from Jesus. Their spirits are renewed. They're inspired. You know, they're transformed. We talk about re being reborn. This is because Jesus granted spiritual salvation through the death of his death on the cross. And the way he was able to do that was through his love to the very end, his surrender to the very end. He could have been on the cross and, and cursed everyone for everything they did. I came to save you. I came to, to, yeah, I came to save you, but you instead kill me. Screw you guys. But instead, he forgave them. And he surrendered to God. And because of that, God was able, he was able to provide spiritual salvation. But because Satan struck his body, because Satan killed him, Jesus was unable or the people, because of the people, Jesus was unable to uh, fulfill uh, physical salvation. So we see this today because we still, people still have original sin. People, the children are still born with original sin. People are still not in oneness with sin, or oneness with God. And we are still tied to our bodily temptations. So, to conceptualize spiritual salvation very quickly, because of Jesus' unity with God, God was able to send down the Holy Spirit. And with, it, with Jesus interacting with the Holy Spirit, they were able to uh, accomplish spiritual salvation. Through the resurrection, actually. When Jesus died, three days later, he resurrected. And through, after after he ascended, Pentecost happened. The Pentecost was when the, the disciples were, the, this Holy Spirit entered the disciples and they traveled across all of Rome, testifying to Jesus, even to the, the risk of death. And they could speak many languages and they were so inspired. And because of Jesus' sacrifice, this spiritual salvation was granted with the help of the Holy Spirit. So this, uh, this was the, the manner of spiritual salvation. But the second advent must come back. Jesus has prophesied that he will come back. What, what is the purpose of that? To provide complete salvation. The second advent must come. And with his bride, his earthly bride, and with his relationship with God,
ultimately provide complete salvation and establish the kingdom of heaven on earth. Sorry, I'm trying to make these diagrams to establish some relationships. So this is what we're looking forward to now as God prepares for the coming of the second Messiah. It's not, uh, it's prophesied that he will come in the same way as Jesus, a humble life, you know, and he will need a bride. Why, why, why would he need a bride? Because the ultimate goal is, is this. Oneness, once again, no original sin, and children born good. So, G, so the second advent and the bride should be the model, the example for the people to, to follow. And through this, we can experience a life of fulfillment that we've all seen. So yes, this is the uh, extent of the Messiah and I. Thank you very much. Samuel, let's give a hand. Samuel. Thank you so much. Went through a lot as well. Um, yeah, I hope that this was able to just kind of get in touch with our relationship with Jesus. If we have one with him or not, um, it's okay. But I think just kind of getting a picture of where we're at with Jesus. And yeah, I think just the framework that you laid out to kind of help us to see the context of Jesus's life. And even maybe put ourselves in the position of John the Baptist too. You know? Like, could we, could we be a testament or could we testify to Jesus? Um, so anyways, I, I really thought this was good to just kind of assess where we're at with Jesus. So simply like, do we ourselves feel like we need a Messiah or a Messianic figure? And what does that mean to us? You know? So yeah, hope that. That was good, and be, being able to even revisit those ideas. Um, so we're getting into discussion questions, and uh, you have questions you want to shoot. So the first question is, uh, what has been your relation? How has your relationship with Jesus, with Jesus been like? And what have you learned from this content? And how can you apply it to your life? Uh, you think you could just repeat it one more time for it? Yeah. So how is your how was your relationship with Jesus throughout your life? And what have you learned through this content? And how can you apply it to your life? Thank you. So yes, Kira will send it to the staff, so the staff will have it. And uh, yeah, we have about thirty minutes for discussion time. Um, but yeah, I also felt like you know it is a pretty deep and also I think kind of personal topic too. So um, if if you guys feel appropriate in your groups, you guys could just start with like. A minute or two, just like silent time, reflection time, and then you guys could get into sharing. Yeah, so we'll gather back for, you know, we'll finish discussion at five o five, and then we'll actually have pretty long break time actually till dinner, um, which is at six. So, yeah, same as last discussion, like we could continue if we want to, or just finish. Um, so. Yeah, 505, finish discussion, and then six is then. Yeah. Yep, that's it. Have a great discussion. Three, two, one, break. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, you. Yeah, sorry, I'm 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 sorry,